Black Panther literally just came out. Unless you're watching this in the future, in which case it's probably been out for a while. Just like any other Marvel film, there's a ton of Easter eggs throughout that you may or may not have caught during your first watch of the movie. So of course, Top 10 Nerd has got you covered, and compiled a list of the best Easter eggs featured in the film. But fair warning, this list has a ton of spoilers. Number 10, coming out. Post credit scenes have become a bit of an expected cliche when it comes to superhero movies, to the point where it's even parodied. Thank you, Deadpool. Black Panther is no exception. It actually has two post credit scenes. While we'll be touching on one of those a little later on, let's chat about the first one that appears midway through the credit sequence. A throwback to an earlier Marvel movie, this scene is T'Challa's I Am Iron Man moment, where the character reveals Wakanda to the rest of the world, opening up in hopes that its advancements will aid in other global issues. And at number 9, Stan Lee. Another staple Easter egg in any Marvel movie is an appearance by Marvel Legend and Black Panther co-creator Stan Lee. Did you guys spot him? He's one of the people in the South Korean casino who ends up claiming T'Challa's poker chips for himself when he leaves them unattended next to Everett Ross. Sneaky. And at number eight, we have Battle Rhinos. In the big final battle of the film, we see T'Challa and Killmonger's forces go head to head. These forces also include Wakabi's Battle Rhinos, who nearly threaten to turn the tide of the battle before T'Challa jumps in and takes them on himself. This is a reference to the 1998 Black Panther miniseries by Peter B. Gillis and Dennis Cohen, with T'Challa's take down of one of the rhinos almost matching the panels exactly. And at number 7, what is love? When Andy Serkis's claw is being held in custody, he repeats a line over and over again. That line is from a 1993 song by Hathaway called What is Love, which was made extremely popular by a Saturday Night Live skit featuring Will Ferrell and Chris Kattan that later became the film A Night at the Roxbury. The song was also my mother's ringtone between 2005 and 2010, so this one was particularly fun for me. What is love? Number 6, Killmonger's Mask. When Killmonger and Ulysses Claw break into the British Museum looking for a vibranium artifact, Killmonger decides to nab a mask, which becomes part of his costume. The mask itself is a throwback to a mask that he wore in the comics during one of his earlier battles with Black Panther, specifically in his appearance in the 2008 Volume 4 run. Up next at 5, his suit. Black Panther's suit is pretty badass. Aside from its overall sleekness, its detail goes a long way in giving it character. The new suit that Shuri designs has mystic runes all over it, which, in the comics, serves more than an aesthetic purpose. It's taken from the Doom War story arc in the comics, where T'Challa started incorporating more magic into his combat tactics as an attempt to not be so reliant on vibranium. This is all while Shuri holds the mantle of Black Panther. Now, the story itself is a bit more complex than that, to be fair, but this is a short video, so. It's also important to note that the introduction of the vibranium nano machines that make up T'Challa's suit act as an explanation for Tony Stark's bleeding edge Iron Man armor that has already been teased in the Avengers Infinity War trailer. And at number 4, Panther's Rage. When T'Challa first faces off against Killmonger, it's at the Warrior Falls, which is an important location. Warrior Falls is the place in the comics where these two had their very first encounter back in the 1970s during the Panther's Rage story arc by Don McGregor. What's even cooler is that in both the comic and the film, Killmonger tosses T'Challa over the falls. Up next at 3. What are those? One of the cheekier jokes in the film comes from Shuri's hilarious reaction to T'Challa's sandals. The joke is actually a reference to a video that went viral and spawned the what are those meme, a video where people were astonished by a police officer who had a unique choice of footwear, and had a very similar reaction to what Shuri has in the film. What are those? And at 2, Back to the Future. Speaking of footwear, Shuri's replacement for T'Challa's sandals is another major easter egg in the movie. They're sneakers that fasten themselves around T'Challa's ankles, a reference to the future Nike sneakers that Marty McFly wears in Back to the Future 2. This is further implied when she reveals that the design was inspired by an old American movie that their father used to watch. Wonder what that could be. And finally, in at number 1, guess who's back. The second post credit scene is a bit of a doozy. That's because it features a character that we've been missing for quite some time, the Winter Soldier himself, Bucky Barnes. Back in Captain America's Civil War, Bucky was put on ice. Now in Wakanda, it's revealed that Shuri has deprogrammed Bucky, and he's in rehabilitation. Yeah, that's where that another broken white boy to fix line came from. But the bigger easter egg comes in the form of what the local kids are calling Bucky. The White Wolf, who in the comics is a character who becomes an orphan after a plane crash, and is then adopted by T'Chaka, T'Challa's father. The White Wolf ends up dealing with prejudice via Wakandas for his skin color, yet manages to rise in the ranks of the Wakanda secret police, then clashes with T'Challa and is exiled. A storyline that's practically recycled into Killmonger's arc in the film, but considering the content, it's likely that the real White Wolf won't be included in the movies. But perhaps some of the traits of the character may be redirected onto Bucky. Alright, there we have it friends. What other easter eggs did you notice in the movie? One of the big absent plot points 
points though was no mention of the soul gem, which we already know is in Wakanda. What do you guys think about that? Let us know all your thoughts and what you're excited for in those comments below. If you dug this video, please show us some love by hitting those like and subscribe buttons. The newest trailer for Disney Plus's television series WandaVision has recently dropped, and there is a lot going on in it. A lot of fast cuts, a lot of hidden characters and props to analyze and pick apart as we try to figure out what it all means. Welcome back, Nerd Squad. WandaVision is a series that centers around Wanda Maximoff, aka the superhero and Avenger known as Scarlet Witch, and her romantic partner, Vision, an artificial intelligence given life by the Mind Stone, who we saw die during the events of Infinity War, killed by Wanda herself, and then brought back to life using the Time Stone only to be killed again by Thanos. And who is also an Avenger. The television series seems to have a name that fittingly refers to what exactly it will be about on multiple levels. For one, it appears as though it is a reference to television and various different sitcoms and TV shows, which, number two, have possibly inspired Wanda to create her own vision of reality using her reality warping powers. And of course, the name also refers to the lead characters of both Wanda, played by Elizabeth Olsen, and Vision, who is played by Paul Bettany. Today, we're going to be taking a look at the newest trailer for the series. Series as we count down the top 10 WandaVision Easter eggs. If you love all things Marvel, check out our exclusively Marvel playlist by clicking on over here, filled with our most marveliest of videos. And be sure to stick around to the end of this list where I will have some bonus content coming your way in the form of comment responses. All right, now let's get counting. It's my own version of chaos magic. Now we count. Number 10, Bewitched. The more we dive into the classic 1950s to 60s vibe for at least part of the show, the more we get constant parallels to the American television sitcom that ran from the mid 60s to early 70s, Bewitched. This classic show also started out in black and white and followed Samantha Montgomery, a witch who met, fell in love with, and married a mortal named Darren Stevens. The show follows their crazy adventures as Samantha struggles to fit into the mortal world and to live the life of an everyday normal housewife. Also, if you're like, what about I Love Lucy, Amanda? We're getting to that. Number nine, Agatha Harkness. You may have noticed at the beginning of the trailer, if you were watching with subtitles on, side note, this is another reason that I love subtitles, that the nosy neighbor character of Wanda and Vision, played by Katherine Hahn, is named Agnes. Many fans think this name could be a covert name for the famous witch from Marvel Comics, Agatha Harkness. Not only does her name seem to be similar to Agatha, but we also see Agnes dressed up as a witch for Halloween in the trailer. Very interesting. Comic fans of Wanda Maximoff will like note that Agatha Harkness is known for not only being a powerful witch, but also for being a teacher to Wanda when it comes to mastering her hex magic. Number 8. Maison du Mépris You may or may not have noticed a very focused shot on a wine bottle in the trailer. Wanda appears to be using her magics to make itself pour, giving us a clear look at the label on its front. It reads Maison du Mépris, which translates from French to English as the House of Misery. This is not only telling for Wanda's and Vision's story to come, but could also be a reference to the famously tragic House of M story. Maison Dupree, House of Misery, House of M. Just saying. Number seven, Mr. and Mrs. Hart. Adding a nod to I Love Lucy, another famous retro American sitcom featuring Lucille Ball and Desi Arnaz, who were married in real life for 20 years and had a very rocky marriage. Mr. and Mrs. Hart are characters we see Wanda and Vision having dinner with in the show. And while some believe they could be Wanda's subconscious trying to break through this fantasy world and get Wanda to face reality, it also appears that Fred Malhamad and Deborah Jo Rupa's characters of Mr. And Mrs. Hart are a reference to a similar relationship that Lucy and Ricky's characters had with their neighbors, Fred and Ethel, in I Love Lucy. Number six, the twins. In the trailer, we also spot a shot of Vision and Wanda carrying two babies, each with one in their arms. It appears the show may be featuring Wanda's magically created, yet fake babies, who are later confusingly reincarnated in the Marvel Universe and are acknowledged as being Wanda's children, while also still having their own different birth parents and families. The twins in the comics which Wanda created using her willpower and reality warping powers are known as Billy and Tommy. Tommy is now known as Thomas Shepard, codenamed Speed. He has white hair and takes after his fake uncle, Pietro Maximov. He's super speedy. Billy, on the other hand, takes after his mother. In the comics, he is now known as Billy Kaplan, aka Wiccan, a magic user with reality warping powers, who recently got married to fellow hero Hulkling. 
So cute. Both are mutants, despite the fact that Wanda and Pietro had their mutant heritage retconned in the comics. Number five, original costume. Yes, I love that we get this Easter egg in here and that we can expect to see it in the series. We get a shot featuring Elizabeth Olsen as Wanda in her original costume. Now, it appears to be a potential Halloween look just based on where she's wearing it and the quality of the costume, which admittedly looks like a pretty high level Halloween costume, but not quite cinematic level. Still, I'm super excited to see her rock this original costume look for Wanda in the series. It's one of my favorite costumes around. I always love a good, strange, and not really functioning headpiece in a costume. Number four, reality warp. Not only do we have that wine bottle to give us a hint that Wanda might be having a psychotic break and creating a fictional alternate reality for everyone to live in, we also get many clear moments where this is implied. From moving through countless decades of fashion and interior design, as well as stylized shots, to a specific moment that we see in the trailer between Vision and Agnes. She seems to be stuck in a trance, which Vision snaps her out of by lightly shocking her. Agnes looks startled to see Vision and asks, am I dead? Vision, puzzled, answers no, why? And she responds cackling, because you are. We also see a shot of Vision's skin turning from gray to red, suggesting that Wanda has brought him back from the dead, but perhaps not really. We could, after all, be living in a false reality which Wanda's powers have created, but how long will that last? Number three, Vision's cape. Not only does Wanda seem to be rocking a Halloween costume version of her original look, but Vision also gets an amazing and comedic one, complete with his dramatically colored bright yellow cape. This costume made its first appearance alongside of Vision in the original Avengers series, Volume 1, Issue 57, out of 1968. I seriously am in love with all these Halloween vibes, and I hope these aren't the only original Halloween looks that we get to see. Hopefully we'll be treated to a few other comic book supers original looks via Halloween costumes maybe worn by residents in this sleepy town which Wanda and Vision seem to have taken up residence in, or which Wanda has created. Number 2, Captain Marvel 2. Near the end of the trailer, we get an amazing surprise. We can see a character flying through the sky, through some kind of force field, possibly what houses or protects Wanda's imaginary world, and landing at the feet of government agents. That character is played by Tayona Paris, who has been confirmed as playing grown-up Monica Rambeau. What does this mean? Likely that WandaVision will have some kind of ties to Captain Marvel's story, potentially weaving into the plot of Captain Marvel 2. Monica Rambeau in the comics was actually the first woman to wear the Captain Marvel mantle, but in the MCU, where she was introduced as Carol's best friend, Maria's daughter, it is likely that we'll see her take up another mantle and potentially work alongside Carol, possibly as Photon, one of her superhero mantles which was hinted at in the first film. Number 1. Sword and Darcy Lewis The government agents that Monica Rambeau seems to collapse in the ground in front of, many believe they're meant to be the S.W.O.R.D. organization, who will be taking the place of S.H.I.E.L.D. in the MCU. Though in the comics, S.W.O.R.D. are more a branch of S.H.I.E.L.D. which deal with monitoring and responding to intergalactic threats. S.W.O.R.D. stands for Sentient World Observation and Response Department. During this shot, you might have also missed the reappearance of a very familiar and long absent character, Darcy Lewis, played by Kat Dennings in the MCU. I love Kat Dennings. Darcy was the friend of Jane Foster, one of the world's most brilliant astrophysicists and Thor's love interest. Darcy was Jane's friend, assistant, and her intern, and worked alongside both Jane herself and her professor, Eric Selvig. You can just barely make her out in the background, but hey, she's there. Slow down the trailer at around 1 minute and 6 seconds to see if you can make it out for yourself. It seems Darcy will be joining S.W.O.R.D. or at least working with them, potentially attempting to assess the threat that Wanda's reality warping powers pose to the world. Thank you so much for watching Nerd Squad. What are some easter eggs that you spotted in this trailer? Which Disney Plus shows are you most excited for? Let us know in the comments below. And speaking of comments, it's time to turn to some comments from one of our latest videos, Top 10 Powers You Didn't Know Madeline Pryor Had. Pete Eddy comments, Spider People, or better, The Attack of the Spider People. Sounds like 1960s B-movie gold. I would totally watch that movie. Better yet, I'd love to visit an alternate Spidey Man's filled world where we get to see that happen, where an army of alternate Spideys are the villains instead of the heroes. Mercury Vincent suggests Amanda McKnight can definitely pull off a Madeline Pryor cosplay. Actually, I'm currently working on one, so stay tuned on my socials and hopefully you'll see more of it in October. I'm just so freaking excited for it. I love Maddie. 
Maybe I'll even wear it on the channel. We shall see. And that's all the time we have for comments today. Be sure to comment below for a chance to have your thoughts and feels shouted out in a future video. This has been Top 10 Nerd, and I'm your host, Amanda McKnight, reminding you to stay nerdy, YouTube. Number four, reality warp. Whoa, my voice cracked. I'm becoming a prepubescent boy. Hello internet, what the hell is going on? And stop exactly what you're doing right now because 20th Century Fox just dropped a brand spanking new trailer for the latest X-Men installment, Dark Phoenix. How's it going guys? Welcome back to Top 10 Nerd. As per usual, I'll be your host Jack Finch as we take it on down to Trailer Town and take a look at the 10 dopest Easter eggs, references and subtle nods to Marvel fandom in the X-Men Dark Phoenix trailer. You think you can fix me? Jean, you are not broken. After months of complete and utter radio silence surrounding this film, we finally get a sneak peek as to what 20th Century Fox have got hiding up their sleeves for us, and well, it's quite a lot. After we were given a little bone to chew on since the events of 2016's X-Men Apocalypse, directed by Brian Singer, the benevolent blaze of the Phoenix Force was soon to rear its graceful head into the X-Men franchise once again, of course as one of the most important comic storylines of all time. Before we chew into that, make sure to hit that thumbs up button if you're a fan of Jean Grey. Sophie Turner, X-Men, or just Top 10 Nerd in general, and ding that subscribe bell so you can stay up to date with our latest and greatest nerd uploads. Now, let's get back to that trailer. The mind is a fragile thing. It takes only the slightest tap to tip it in the wrong direction. Kicking off at number 10, this is the end. First things first, let's get that song out of the way, because while it might not exactly seem like it, this is a pretty big deal for Singer's X-Men franchise, because as you all know, recently the MCU finally acquired the rights to the long divided X-Men, and finally, finally we can see a complete part of the world that we all know and love, where mutants and Spider-Man can skip hand in hand together forever. But that's a big deal for this X-Men franchise. This is the end, literally. It's coming to its final conclusion. The song, which is a cover of the iconic 1967 Doors track, The End, sprawls its way throughout the trailer. And I'm not exactly saying that it's a subtle nod to the closing moments of the series as we know it, but it's also definitely that. Goodbye, convoluted storylines. Hello, Retcon. Next up at number nine, Little Jean Grey. I'm not going to lie, the X-Men franchise has had some pretty terrible continuity, particularly with Jean Grey, as threads of her story have been picked up sporadically since her first glimpse in 2003's X2. Then again, in 2006, we got much more of her in the controversial X-Men The Last Stand, where Famke Janssen's Jean Grey turned into an atomic bomb of a mentally unstable villain, rather than the ambivalent cosmic entity that we know the Phoenix Force to be. But, however, this trailer seems to be taking us in a different route, one that's much truer to the comic books and Jean Grey's relationship with the Phoenix Force. The trailer opens with a little girl, a young Jean Grey, heading out into the X Mansion alongside a younger Charles Xavier as the two try and cobble together a psychic solution to Jean's unwitting cosmic problem. What this seems to do is completely negate the introduction between Xavier, Magneto and Jean in The Last Stand, and rightfully so. Coming in at number 8, Lilandra, maybe? You feel like you don't belong here. You don't. Ever since her involvement was announced back in 2017, fans have been speculating as to who Jessica Chastain will be playing in the film. Well, she's kept pretty stum about her role in the film, but Fox did recently reveal that her character name would be Smith. In the trailer, we see a platinum haired Jessica creep up through a rainy scene and a church. She then says to Jean, you feel like you don't belong here. You don't. They can't begin to comprehend what you are. Well, this is an illusion definitely has its root into the cosmic, and some fan theories are still speculating speculating as to whether Chastain will play the role of Lilandra, the Empress of the Shi'a, a massively powerful race of aliens that are aware of the Phoenix Force. Fox is playing their cards close to their chest, but whichever character this is will likely play a pivotal role. Next up at number seven, you're a liar, Charles. It's your fault, Charles. The world is on the brink. I'm sorry, I didn't stop it sooner. True to the comics, it's been a central theme since the last stand that Charles Xavier has been using his powers to suppress the Phoenix Force inside Jean Grey by adding mental blocks to ensure that it never fully takes control. She couldn't do it alone, and Charles recognizes this fact, much to the unwitting dismay of others. Well, that seems to be exactly the same with the upcoming Dark Phoenix, where Charles has to come clean to the fact that he's been augmenting Jean's mind, much to the hubris of Mystique, although Wolverine played that part in the 
last stand. Contrary to the haphazard way that the last stand handled it though, this trailer is seemingly giving us a much more darker tone to the fact that a psychic has been meddling with the mind of a young girl. I guess we'll see how that one plays out. At number 6, no yellow spandex. You came here looking for permission. Gene. Yeah, and unfortunately for us, or fortunately, we're seeing yet another departure from the yellow spandex with seemingly the third or fourth, I've lost count, design change in what seems to be the span of a couple of years. In this brief instance, we see that Xavier is the only character not wearing the blue uniform with a large yellow X stitched across it. And well, it's quite a faithful adaptation of the original X-Men costume design, which, yet again, seems to be another nod to the continuity with the comics. Good stuff. Swinging in at number five, the Brotherhood of Mutants. It's been a central theme throughout the last two X-Men movies, which personally were the only ones that came close to hitting the mark with the mutant awesomeness of the X-Men. Fassbender plays a fantastic Magneto, and his political foray into the identity of the mutant population doesn't seem to be slowing down in this iteration. As the trailer shows, Magneto is back to his usual ways, where he seemingly takes in Jean Grey to his renegade band of mutants in a weird commune kind of thing. As She's in hot pursuit of a solution to her Phoenix Force problem. Again, this was lightly touched upon in The Last Stand, and yeah, we can just forget about that film. More interesting, though, is a small scene in the trailer that seemingly shows that Beast has also switched sides, seemingly out of betrayal to Xavier in anger for what he did or will do to Jean. Coming in at number four, a fiery romance. There's still hope. Don't do this. Of course, this can't really be a Jean Grey based movie without a storyline involving Scott Summers. Although, weirdly enough, the relationship was barely even referred to in X Men Apocalypse, so perhaps they'll be stirring things up a bit in their coup de grace for the final film. Although it's only briefly glimpsed in the trailer, Jean and Scott seem to have a small, tender moment alluded to in their deeper relationship throughout the film, where Scott seems to defend Jean on numerous occasions throughout the trailer, urging the rest of the X Men not to view her as a villain, despite the fact that she's probably scorched near enough everybody that she's come across at this point. It's a nod towards Chris Claremont's Dark Phoenix saga, where Cyclops and Jean Grey's relationship was a major aspect of that comic book run. Hopefully, Sophie Turner's Dark Phoenix will do a true justice to one of the most iconic mutant love stories of all time. Next up at number three, Xavier and Magneto at it again. It can't be an X-Men film without Magneto, can it? And once again, the trailer seems to point towards the ideological battle that these two titanic mutants seem to be hashing out at the expense of others. It seems that again this will be a major plot point in Dark Phoenix with both Magneto and Professor X trying to find different solutions to the exact same problem, the Phoenix Force. In one scene Fassbender seems to deliver an absolutely killer line to Charles. You're always sorry Charles and there's always a speech and nobody cares. Such shade, but it seems that we're going to see a much colder side to Magneto. Well, if it can get any colder, but what we've always seen between the pair is a quiet admiration for each other, a quiet respect. But Magneto seems to be turning up the hate toward his old friend if this trailer is anything to go by. And will that have any repercussions to the final outcome of the Dark Phoenix storyline? We'll have to wait and see. And number two spot, who's dead? You're right to fear me. I've seen evil. Speaking of the final outcomes of the Dark Phoenix Saga, someone is definitely ending up six feet under. And well, we know for sure that it's not Charles, Beast or Storm because they're all standing around the graveside. Also, it always rains at a funeral. In the trailer, we see a top-down show of a grave with five bundles of flowers on top of freshly dug earth. It's a funeral for sure, they're not visiting an old graveside, but the real question is, who's dead? Now, is this a nod to the death of the franchise as we know it, amid certainty of the Disney Fox deal and the MCU's final control of the X-Men. I mean, perhaps it could just be some minor character related to Jean Grey, but why would they all show up, like, so morose? Maybe it's the end of the film, and if it's following the events of the Dark Phoenix saga, then maybe this is Jean Grey's grave. Well, I guess we're left guessing until then. And finally, at number one, the Phoenix, of course, because this is the Dark Phoenix trailer, and we have to talk about how awesome of a saga the Phoenix Force truly is. 20th Century Fox have tried to get Jean Grey's involvement with the cosmic entity right on quite a few occasions, and they've pretty much always missed the mark, particularly in the events of The Last Stand. Now, I know this is just a trailer, and I don't want to put all of my eggs into one basket, but I think Sophie Turner is our best chance at getting an accurate representation of the Phoenix Force 
looks. And if the little that we do see in the trailer is anything to go by, then we're in for some intense telekinetic showdowns. There are moments throughout the trailer where Sophie Turner seems to deliver that cold, emotionless level of destruction that the Dark Phoenix is known for. And I, for one, have got a good feeling that this is just the beginning. Well, what do you guys think? Let us know your thoughts in the comment box down below. Cheers for sticking around, folks. I hope you're pumped for Dark Phoenix as much as we are. If you'd like to continue your Marvel binge, feel free to hit that playlist floating shortly above. Tune in tomorrow for your daily dose of nerd. As per usual, I've been your host, Jack Finch. You've been watching Top 10 Nerd. And until next time, you take it easy. Greetings, nerdy list aficionados. So Avengers Endgame Easter eggs. So before we even talk about anything, spoilers. If you don't want to know anything, please stop now. We will be diving into that territory. So be forewarned, for forewarned is forearmed. Before we get started, I am thrilled to announce that this video is brought to you by Amino, specifically Marvel Amino. Amino Apps is the amazing service where you can create fan communities about, well, pretty much anything. You can share art, polls, role play, and now it just got a little more exciting because you can now use Amino Stories, a fun, fast, exciting way to share all of your fandom experiences. It's a new community feature. Let me explain. You can have up to 10 slides. Your scenes must be in between 3 and 15 seconds, so 2 minutes and 30 seconds of bite-sized fun. And you can edit your scenes with the trim feature, reorder them, add music to completely customize your story. And I'm telling you all this because we want to see your stories. As you can see from the title of this video, we just saw the Avengers and we can't believe it. We want your spoiler-free stories. It's a great way to connect with friends and stay tapped in with your Amino community. No more leaving to create stories elsewhere. Now everything you need is on Amino. Follow us at Top 10 Nerd on Marvel Amino to share your Amino stories. Why yes, my hair was different, just like Black Widow. I'm Sasha and let's do this. Last chance to get out and not be spoiled. Do it now. Number 10. Russo cameo. It is not uncommon for directors to appear in their movies, and the Russos are no exceptions. You can see a brother at one of the support meetings run by Steve, for survivors of the snap who are attempting to move on with their lives. The director in this case, Joe, details his attempts to go on a date and how both him and his companion began crying, but they decided that they would see each other again. This movie brings the feels. If you felt the last one was lacking in any character moments, this one brings them in spades. Better than an M. Night cameo, I think. Number 9. Expend names. Since Disney has acquired far more rights and assets than they had when they started the MCU, it is now more likely than ever that properties such as the X-Men and the Fantastic Four could appear in this universe.
or potentially some setup for her solo movie. In films, nothing is placed there by accident, especially not so prominently in the foreground. Number 5. The Big Lebowski After the events of Infinity War, Thor isn't doing so well. The deaths of his family and everyone he knows are really starting to weigh on him, and he has descended into a life of wastefulness and video games. He has grown out long hair and a beard, drinks beer, wears a long robe and loose shirt. In a sense, he has become the dude. And Tony even refers to him as Lebowski. The Big Lebowski is a 1998 cult film starring Jeff Bridges. It tackles slacker culture. In this film, Jeff Bridges plays a character named The Dude, who ends up on a series of random adventures because of his hapless nature. In fact, a large part of the plot is driven forward by a rug. <laughs> They gotta find the rug, it's a great movie. Number four, America's Ass. Okay, seriously, get out, spoilers. During the time heist, a crew of Iron Man, the Hulk, Captain America, and Ant-Man go back to 2012, to the incident in New York, to get the stones. While there, Tony comments on the costume that Cap had during that era, and says it does nothing for Cap's ass. Ant-Man reiterates that it's America's ass, a sentiment that Captain America parrots after a duel with himself leads to him knocking himself out. He confirms that it is indeed America's ass. This is a reference to all of the memes and lusts surrounding Cap's rear during 2012 after the Avengers film was released. There were gifts for days. It started pretty specifically after the gym scene. You know the one, Cap punching the punching bag? There are a lot of thirsty people out there, and they're still thirsty. There were whole fan pages dedicated to this, just blogs about Captain America's fantastic rear. I mean, you know, it is amazing. I like it. It's not Nightwing, but still. Number three. Harley. So okay, well get your tissues ready. But if you imagine that this film is going to be the end of the road for some of our heroes, then you were 100% right. And during one of the hero's send-offs, the characters are there. All of them. Just a huge, huge, massive scene. This includes Harley, who is part of Iron Man 3, the child that helps Tony repair his armor and also manages to help him overcome his PTSD, thanks to the magic of being a child in a movie. A full-grown Harley attends the funeral, and even gets his own full pan. Nick Fury was also there, and John John Favreau reprised his role as Happy. Never forget John Favreau started it all. People tend to forget that he directed Iron Man. Number two, New Asgard. In the film, the remaining Asgardians have settled in a little coastside town called New Asgard. The thing is, that spot is exactly where Odin said that people would settle in Thor Ragnarok, right before Loki and Thor battle Hela for the first time. Odin, wise and all seeing till the end but still a terrible parent. Actually, this movie was all about tying up loose ends. Also, that whole fisherman town thing was very Aquaman. I was just waiting for him to show up. Crossover time. Number one, Hail Hydra. So I make this joke all the time, and so does the internet. Hydra Cap, the arc that produced the infamous panel of Captain America saying, Hail Hydra. Ultimately, this arc was undone very quickly, as it proved to not only be extremely memeable, but also highly unpopular, to have such an icon essentially be turned into one of the very villains he fought against. Well, in keeping with this film showing that it is indeed aware of the culture surrounding these films, they had a little fun with this. In order to get one of the Infinity Stones, Captain America must go undercover and shield as a Hydra agent in order to get the asset he seeks. He leans in and says the infamous, Hail Hydra. Amazing, so perfect, and way better than how the line was originally implemented. So I really hope you clicked off if you didn't want to be spoiled. But I have to say, no spoilers now, I really enjoyed this film. I will 100% see it again. And it felt like a fitting cap on this era. To me at least. Mileage will 100% vary. If you've seen it, let me know what you think about it, and will you be seeing it again? Thanks so much for joining us here on Top 10 Nerd. I'm Sasha, and well, whatever it takes. Like, share, comment, subscribe, and we'll see you again next time. Bye. Welcome back, Nerd Squad. My name is Roya Destroya, and this is Top 10 Nerd. Let me set the scene here for you. You're watching a Marvel movie. Tensions are rising, the world's in danger. The heroes are racing to save it, when out of the blue, a familiar face pops out. It's Stan Lee, who does not let us forget that without him, Marvel would be next to nothing. And the theater bursts into laughter, and all is right in the world. Our world, at least. The movie world is still very much in danger. So let's take a look at the Top 10 Stan Lee Easter eggs. In the number 10 spot,
spot as Ant-Man. Ant-Man came out in 2015, and though the movie had a changeover in directors, it retains this lovely little surprise of a scene. During a retelling of his friend meeting a girl, Louis gives us a flashback into a bar, and who is the bartender? None other than Lee himself. With Louis's voice dubbed over his lip syncing, we can still hear it in his voice though. The scene is only a split second, but some crazy, stupid, fine comedic timing. Next in number nine is Spider-Man: Homecoming. Homecoming of 2017 was full of little laughs sprinkled throughout, but none got the theater cracking up quite as much as this appearance of Lee. He popped his head out the window to say a stern word during the scene where Spidey attempts to prevent someone from stealing their own car. Then he hangs around to chat with the neighbor, and you get the feel that he's probably like that with his real life neighbors too. In the number eight spot is Thor. We have two top ten nerd videos for superheroes who can lift Thor's hammer, and no, Stan Lee did not make the list. This doesn't stop him from trying, of course, but not without cheating. A surprise drop in in New Mexico in this 2011 film turns out to be the Marvel chairman himself. Instead of leaving with the hammer, he seems to leave with a rather large auto repair bill. You can't cheat the Mjolnir. Up in number seven, we have Deadpool. In this 2016 movie, Stan Lee appears kinda in the last place we would imagine him. In fact, we're hoping none of you imagine Stan in a strip club, but here he takes the role of strip club MC, a much more risque cameo than we were used to seeing. But luckily for our children, Stan was not actually in a strip club filming, but rather a studio offsite, and the scene was added in post production. Although he says next time he wants to be around for the real deal. Coming in at number six, we got Captain America Civil War. In this 2016 movie, Stanley takes up a new job as a FedEx delivery man. There is such a juxtaposition with this cameo because the whole movie has tension thick enough to cut with a knife. Friends have turned on each other. Tony Stark and James Rhodes are having real serious talks. And then here comes Stan Lee, clutching his little box, looking for Tony Stank. Could not have been better timing. Next up at number five is Guardians of the Galaxy 2. This cameo from the 2017 movie actually has some theories behind it that tie it together with every other cameo. Stanley in space explaining his role of FedEx man sounds familiar, right? Actually gave birth to the theory that Lee was the same person in every cameo. A time and space traveler who trades jobs every so often and wants to share this knowledge with those who collect the knowledge of the universe, the Watchers. Up next in number four, we have The Simpsons. Okay, so it's not a movie, but it's one of my favorites, so I get to put it on the list. During the episode I Am Furious Yellow, Stanley drops by the Android's dungeon and lets Bart down easy by telling him his homemade comic stinks. He also proceeds to shift the store display around so that Marvel titles are covering all the DC ones. I know he wouldn't do that in real life, probably, but for some reason this scene just feels so him. In the number three spot, we got X Men. The cameo in this 2000 movie was the very first big picture appearance, so it deserves a spot so high up on the list today. Despite Lee not actually having any lines, he is a hot dog vendor on the beach here, and it's quite easy to miss, making it seem the most like an Easter egg out of all of these. That, plus people back then were still kind of in the dark about what he even looked like. The glimpse is fleeting, but the reward for those with an eagle eye is oh so great. Almost as great as the amount of sunscreen that guy is using on his girlfriend, which is greatly obscene. Coming in at number two is Avengers Age of Ultron. Ultron's 2015 cameo ranks so high up here because Stanley claims that it was his favorite of them all. If you were curious, his least favorite was 2002 Spider-Man, because as he jokingly put it, it didn't let his acting abilities shine through. But apparently him partaking in the liquor of the gods and being dragged out drunk showcased them quite nicely, according to him anyway. And finally, in the number one spot is Trial of the Incredible Hulk. This cameo tops the list because this is where it all began. Trial of the Incredible Hulk was a made for TV movie in 1989. It was Marvel's first cinematic crossover, featuring the Hulk and Daredevil. And it was also the first time we would see a Stanley cameo as the jury foreman. From this, a tradition was born. Could have given that courtroom a warning now, couldn't ya? So those were the top 10 Stanley Easter eggs. Let me know in the comments section down below which one of these was your favorite. My name is Ray Destroya. Thanks for watching, and don't forget to subscribe so you never miss another nerdy list. Ant Man and the Wasp had some pretty big shoes to fill. Being the follow-up to Avengers Infinity War, people have a lot of expectations for how the film will connect to the rest of what's happened in the MCU. Aside from giving us a few answers and fueling a few theories, the film is filled with a bunch of easter eggs and references that got fans of the MCU and of the comics quite excited. So today, we're counting down a handful of those easter eggs and references from the movie. And at number 10, it's them! There's one point in the film where Bill Foster spots a bunch of ants crawling through the lab. In response, he lets out a line, 
It's Them. This is actually a reference to the film Them. Them is a classic science fiction monster movie from 1954. A black and white picture, the film was one of the first nuclear monster movies, and the very first big bug feature. It tells the story of a nest of gigantic, irradiated ants found in the New Mexico desert that quickly becomes a national threat when they break loose. It's got some pretty iconic shots that you may recognize even if you're not totally familiar with the sci-fi side of classical Hollywood cinema. Anywho, it's an apt reference, all things considered. Plus, Scott, Hope, and Cassie are all watching them at the end of the film too. And at number 9, Animal House. When Scott is kidnapped, you may have noticed that he's watching something. It's Animal House, the 1978 film starring Jim Belushi. The scene he's watching in particular has a cheeky connection to the content of Ant-Man and the Wasp. It's a scene with Pintlow, played by Tom Hulse, and Dave Jennings, played by Donald Sutherland, where the two are stoned and carry on a conversation about how there are galaxies within atoms. Even in his downtime, Scott just can't get away from the quantum realm, can he? And at number 8, Stan Lee. Of course there's a Stan Lee cameo. Stan Lee has made a cameo in every single has a history in the comics as being a villain named Egghead. Egghead is one of the sillier Marvel villains out there. He was an atomic scientist with an egg
out with your thoughts in those comments below. Avengers Endgame is the biggest event in the Marvel Cinematic Universe to date. And naturally, like other MCU films, it's full of a ton of easter eggs, references, and callbacks to previous movies. And much, much more. While we previously did an easter egg list for the film on this channel, with like two parts, we've decided to come up with a list that includes every single one that we spotted. Specifically pertaining to easter eggs that appeared in Endgame and not ones that were carried over for Infinity War. So no, we're not mentioning Morgan Stark in this one. Y'all already got that easter egg in the previous movie. So with that in mind, this is our list of all 84 easter eggs in Avengers Endgame. At the beginning of the film, Hawkeye is training his daughter how to shoot arrows. He says, you see where you're going, now let's worry about how you get there. This is a meta reference to the MCU and how prior to 2008's Iron Man, Marvel Studios had planned out the trajectory of the franchise. When Clint's family is dusted, we hear the sound of thunder. This is the same sound effect used in Infinity War and Wakanda when all of the heroes were dusted. When Tony is recording his message to Pepper, he says the line, don't post this on social media. This is a throwback to 2008's Iron Man when Tony, towards the beginning of the film, tells the military private who wants a photo with him, I don't want to see this on your MySpace page. Oh, it was a different time. Also in that recording, Tony mentions that he has been stranded in space for 22 days. Avengers Endgame is the 22nd film of the franchise. Tony also calls Nebula a blue meanie. This is a reference to the villains from the 1968 animated movie Yellow Submarine, the Beatles movie. In Yellow Submarine, the Beatles travel through the sea of time, which is a nice little relevant reference for Endgame and its plot. Let's talk about Tony's wardrobe for a second. When he and Nebula are fixing the Guardian's ship, or at least trying to, he's wearing a black tank top. This is the same outfit that he wears in the Iron Man film while making his Mark I armor while being held hostage in that cave. Speaking of outfits, moving on to Rocket's costume. Rocket's new costume is from the Dan Abnett and Andy Landing Guardians of the Galaxy Vol. 2 comics. The same comics that inspired James Gunn's version of the team in the MCU. After Tony is rescued and returns to the Avengers compound, he gets quite upset during their group meeting. He mentions a line that's actually a callback to a previous film, a suit of armor around the world. He's basically quoting himself from Age of Ultron. I see a suit of armor around the world. This conversation also mirrors another conversation that he had with Cap in which he says, how are you guys planning on beating them? To which Cap responds, together. Tony then says, we'll lose. And Cap barks back, we'll do that together too. Tony's got some fun names for Rocket Raccoon. He calls Rocket a Build-A-Bear and also later on, calls him Ratchet. The latter one is actually pretty funny considering it's a reference to the Ratchet and Clank video game. We soon get another glimpse of Thanos. This is where we get the first glimpse of Thanos in the film. He's retired to a place called the Garden. Now note that Infinity War was filled with a ton of religious imagery, so the Garden lines up well with this, with the idea that Thanos is God and that he retired on the seventh day after his work was done. Another nice tie to the Garden comes from the comics though, in which Thanos, when acquiring the Infinity Gem, for the first time goes to see the Gardener, an elder being who belonged to one of the first races to develop after the Big Bang. The Gardener using the Soul Gem used it to create a valley and was obsessed with peace and quiet. Thanos visits him and then uses the gems he's already acquired to cause the Gardener's death, pushing vines throughout his body, impaling him. When the Avengers go to space to find Thanos in his garden, the honeycomb matrix that appears when the Guardian ship flies through space there is similar to the one that appears in the Guardians of the Galaxy movies. In Thanos' garden, he has created a scarecrow out of his suit of armor. This is actually taken directly from the comics. See the similarities? In the scene that introduces us to Thanos' garden, we get a reference to another critically acclaimed film, an Oscar winning film. Thanos runs his fingers along along his crops in the garden. This is an homage to the film Gladiator, in which Russell Crowe's character is seen doing the same action during the scenes in which his character is at peace and about to be reunited with his family upon his death. After the Avengers find out that Thanos has destroyed the Infinity Stones using the Infinity Stones, Thor goes for the head. That is a callback to Infinity War, when Thor did not go for the head. We then get a scene that takes place in a support group. Steve Rogers is running the group discussion, and we get a cameo from Joe Russo, the co-director of the film. He was also playing the first openly gay character, not to be confused with first openly bisexual character, which was Valkyrie. But what's even cooler than the co-director's cameo is the other cameo from another member of the support group, Jim Starlin, the man who created Thanos in the Marvel comic universe and also is responsible for the Infinity Gauntlet story arc, in which Infinity War was loosely based off of. Speaking of cameos, Ken Jeong appears in the film. He plays a security guard when Scott Lang returns, who lets him out of the compound. The Russo brothers worked with him on Community, and funny enough, there was a point in the Community series where he actually was a security guard. Speaking of Community, Yvette Nicole Brown also makes a cameo. She shows up later in the film at Camp Lahai and takes an awkward elevator ride with Cap and Tony, later to report them as being suspicious individuals. But back 
back to Ken though. When he first notices Scott on the security cameras, he's reading a book. The terminal breached by J.G. Ballard. In that book is a short story called Endgame. Now, Ballard, the writer, is known for writing post apocalyptic novels and short stories. Moving on to when Black Widow is talking to a couple of the Avengers and Nebula and Rocket via holographic projection. Carol Danvers has a haircut. It's the same haircut that the character had in the comics. But also in the scene, we see a nice little detail of Black Widow's. Next to Natasha's desk in that same scene, you can spot a pair of ballet slippers in the shot. The ballet shoes are tied to her past in the red room, with the ballet school being the cover for the infamous assassin training program that we got to see a glimpse of in Age of Ultron. The rat that we see in the van scene that runs over the machine that lets Scott out the quantum realm, aka the one that saves the universe, could be a subtle reference to Disney, aka Mickey Mouse. Rats and whatnot. When Scott Lang returns, his van is locked in spot 616, which is likely referring to the main continuity of the Marvel timeline in the comics on Earth 616. When Scott stumbles upon the Vanish Memorial, he is looking for his daughter Cassie Lang's name. He doesn't find it and instead finds his. But if you look closely, you'll see another familiar Marvel Universe name, Roberto da Costa. Roberto is an X Men character who joins the new mutants who first appeared in Marvel Graphic Novel issue 4 back in 1982, created by Chris Claremont and Bob McCloud. When the Avengers seek out Tony, there's actually a Callback to Age of Ultron. In that film, at the end, when Tony is discussing things with Cap, he mentions that maybe he should take a page out of Barden's book, Living on a Farm. That's exactly what he ended up doing. When the gang are trying to convince Tony to help out, Tony makes fun of the name that Scott had actually called the plan, Time Heist, which is a reference to an episode of Doctor Who from 2005. That's not the only time travel reference. When the Avengers are testing out the time travel machine, Rhodey and Scott make a bunch of references to time travel rules, which are all basically pulled from the rules of time travel from the Back to the Future franchise. Something their teammates then make fun of them for. Funny enough, while the bannerfied Hulk says that time travel doesn't work that way, we do see a lot of similarities between Back to the Future and Endgame, with various characters sneaking around their past selves. Speaking of the bannerfied Hulk, this film gave us a glimpse of Professor Hulk, Smart Hulk from the comics, specifically Peter David's comic, where he first introduced the blending of Hulk and Bruce Banner into one persona. Another nice little reference that comes from that scene with Rhodey and Scott and bannerfied Hulk is the mention of killing baby Thanos. This could actually be a reference to the plot of Cosmic Ghost Rider, a more recent Marvel storyline that takes place on Earth TRN 666, in which the Punisher becomes Ghost Rider after Thanos wipes out Earth, and eventually becomes Galactus's Herald when the Destroyer of Worlds wants to take on Thanos. Cosmic Ghost Rider ends up going back in time to kill baby Thanos, but can't do it, and instead raises the child himself. I Love You 3000 has become a pretty iconic catchphrase after the movie. Funny enough, that might actually be taken from Iron Man 3000, an inversion table that's used as a piece of workout equipment. When Tony reconciles with Cap and presents him with his shield, you can hear the theme from Captain America First Avenger playing. This isn't the only moment in the film. There's a lot of musical callbacks that appear throughout. New Asgard is in Tonsberg, Norway. It's the place where Odin, before passing away suggested where Asgard could find a new home, saying this could be Asgard. That happened in Thor Ragnarok and is also the place where Thor fought Hela. And fun fact, it's also the city where Red Skull acquired the Tesseract in Captain America the First Avenger. As Rocket and Hulk are riding into New Asgard, there's a song playing by the Kinks called Supersonic Rocket Ship. The song is about a ship that's a refuge, which feels appropriate since the Asgardians had escaped Asgard on a refugee ship, the same one that was destroyed at the beginning of Infinity War. And New Asgard is their new refuge. There's a point in which Tony makes fun of Thor's new look, calling him the Big Lebowski. It's pretty spot on. Let's talk about Meek and Korg. Korg specifically. Korg's pineapple shirt is a reference to the pineapple jumper that Thor Ragnarok director and Korg actor Taika Waititi wore at San Diego Comic Con. Speaking of Korg and Meek, the two are playing a video game when Hulk and Rocket arrive. It's Fortnite, the game that recently had a crossover with Marvel Studios. That's not the only reference though, because if you look closely at the Fortnite game they're playing, they're actually facing off against the Grandmaster, aka Jeff Goldblum from Thor Ragnarok. He's going under the name of Noob Master. Clint's new persona, Ronin, is actually taken from the comics. The wardrobe is pretty spot on. The Yakuza member that he's fighting is actually from the comics as well. His name is Akiko, who led the Shogun Reapers in the Nick Fury comic book. The Avengers time travel suit is clearly modeled after Hank Pym's original Quantum Realm suit. You can see the similarities, especially in the helmet. When the Avengers all come together to discuss the locations of the Infinity Stones, the photo that we see of Jane Foster at the Avengers compound when the team are recapping where each of the stones are is the same one that appears in Avengers, the first Avengers film, when Coulson explains why Foster is not around to be consulted. They thought they had ridden her out, but nope, Natalie Portman comes back for more. Vormir is mentioned in the same scene, and Rocket says that it is the center of celestial existence. Some have suggested that this could be a plot hint for the upcoming Eternals MCU film. At one point, you can see the Hulk eating Hoka Hoka Burnin' Fudge ice cream from Ben & Jerry's. It's an ice cream easter egg. 
Funny enough, in Infinity War, Tony Stark had mentioned Ben and Jerry's had named an ice cream flavor after him. Looks like Hulk got the treatment too. When Hawkeye and Black Widow are headed to Voromir, Hawkeye says this is a long way from Budapest. This is referencing Budapest like they did in the first Avengers film. When Natasha says that the Battle of New York is like Budapest all over again, to which Clint responds, You and I remember Budapest very differently. During the 2012 flashback, the name Dr. List is mentioned. That's Baron von Strucker's chief scientist. He's name dropped after the covert Hydra agents acquire the scepter. That's then followed by the elevator sequence. Now, this is a throwback to Captain America Winter Soldier when Cap was in the elevator with pretty much the same group of people. Almost. He ends up kicking some major butt, and it was one of the more memorable fight sequences of the movie. Except this time, he doesn't do that. Instead, we get him whispering to Jasper Sitwell, Hail Hydra. This is actually a nice little tongue in cheek moment that references 2007's Captain America Steve Rogers and the following Secret Empire story arc, in which Cap was revealed to be a Hydra sleeper agent and secretly a Nazi. That got revised though. Good that they're making fun of it. Cap has another great line that he says shortly afterwards. I can do this all day. He says this when he fights his 2012 self. It's a line throwback to several moments. Moments throughout the Captain America movies. But perhaps a more memorable moment when Cap fought himself was after he kicked his own butt, and then looks down literally at his butt and says, That is America's ass. That's thanks to the internet and all of the memes that came out commenting on how great America's ass was when the original Avengers film came out. When the 2014 Thanos finds out about what the Avengers are up to, he calls them unruly. This is actually something that the Mad Titan called them in the end credits scene of the 2012 Avengers film. It's called a thesaurus, Thanos. When Nebula and War Machine are on Morag, we get to see the Guardians of the Galaxy opening, but from a different angle. It's arguably a little bit funnier. Speaking of Morag, War Machine aka Rhodey makes an Indiana Jones reference when he and Nebula go to get the Power Stone, saying that there should be booby trap spikes with skeletons stuck to them. This is an obvious reference to Raiders of the Lost Ark. After Steve and Tony go back to the 70s to acquire more Pym Particles and the Tesseract, we get a Stan Lee cameo. He shouts out, make love not war, as he speeds by in a car past Camp Lehigh. But what's even better is his bumper sticker that we see. It says, Nuff said. This is actually a common catchphrase of Stan's that appeared often in Stan's soapbox in the comics. In that same 70s era, we see Captain America wearing a shirt that has the name Roscoe on it. This is a reference to Roscoe Simons, who was Captain America briefly in 1975. He didn't last long. Red Skull actually crucified him and tortured him. Speaking of villains, let's talk about Arnim Zola. When Tony runs into his father, Howard Stark, Howard is looking for Zola. We learn in The Winter Soldier that Zola was the one responsible for Hydra infiltrating shields. He was last seen as an AI in that film. In that exact same room, actually. Speaking of other familiar faces, let's talk about Jarvis. James Darcy reprises his role as Jarvis from the Agent Carter MCU television series. He appears when Howard Stark is leaving Camp Lehigh. We also get to see a de-aged Michael Douglas. But perhaps what's neater is the retro Ant-Man helmet in his lab. It's the helmet that Hank Pym wore in his earlier comic appearances. Perhaps in the MCU, this is just a prototype. We also see Peggy Carter's office. There's a frame photo of Cap that Steve sees that turns out is actually the same photo that she looks at at the end of the first Avenger movie. Let's hop on over to 2014 now. On Vormir, Red Skull's speech is exactly the same one that he gave to Thanos in Infinity War. When debating over who will use the new gauntlet the Avengers have created, Thor says that he's the strongest Avenger and should be using it. This is actually a callback to Thor Ragnarok when Thor attempts to log into the ship and tries to use the codename Strongest Avenger. When Hulk wears the gauntlet, he ends up dropping to the floor in crippling pain. Tony wants to call off the experiment, but Steve, on the other hand, asks him if he can take it. To which Bruce replies, yes, I can handle it. This is actually a callback to the first Avenger, when Steve was being transformed to Captain America and had shouted, I can handle it. After Thanos bombs the Avengers compound, Hulk ends up holding up a bunch of rubble to save the other Avengers members. This is actually a reference to the cover of Secret Wars issue 4. In the big battle that follows, Thanos tries to push Stormbreaker into Thor's chest similar to what Thor did to the Mad Titan in Infinity War. Except I guess that Thanos wouldn't have known about that yet. Thanos breaks Cap's shield in their end struggle. This is actually a reference to the Infinity Gauntlet comic, in which he does basically the exact same thing. It's also a reference to Tony's vision in Age of Ultron where we see Cap's broken shield lying next to him while he's dead. When Sam radios Captain America when he's faced with Thanos' army, he says, on your left. This is a callback to Winter Soldier. Twice. Once when the two were running and Steve called it out to Sam, and the second when Steve was in a hospital bed in the film. When all the Avengers finally show up thanks to Doctor Strange and, you know, being undusted, Steve Rogers says the famous line, Avengers Assemble. This line was actually teased at the end of Age of Ultron, but never finished. Pepper Potts shows up in her comic book alter ego, Rescue. It's also the mask that Tony's daughter was playing with at the start of the film. 
Howard the Duck can be spotted in the big final battle. When Wasp shows up, he's just to the right of the frame and he's holding a machine gun. Wasp also says a line, we're on it Cap. It's a nice little callback to Ant-Man and the Wasp, when Wasp was making fun of Ant-Man for calling Captain America Cap. In that same battle, Spider-Man activates something called his instant kill setting. This setting is something that we first saw in Spider-Man Homecoming, except Peter is clearly more under control of his suit now. Right before Tony snaps, he says the line, I am Iron Man. This line is from 2008's Iron Man when Tony revealed to the public his true identity. After Tony has snapped, Thanos sits down. He sits like he did at the end of Infinity War. Except now, he knows that everything is over and he is going to be dusted. At Tony's funeral, the holographic projection of Tony says that we are not alone in the universe. This is another meta reference. It's a callback to when Nick Fury tried to recruit him as part of the Avengers initiative. We also see the arc reactor that Pepper had given Tony on his funeral wreath. It says proof that Tony Stark has a heart. It was a gift that Pepper gave Tony at the end of the first film, back in 2008. There's a bunch of familiar faces at Tony's funeral, including the kid from Iron Man 3, Harley Keener, except he's no longer a kid. Afterwards, Happy Hogan and Morgan Stark, Tony's daughter, have a nice little conversation. He asks her if she's hungry and she says yes and that she wants a cheeseburger. This is a reference to the cheeseburger request from the first Iron Man film after Tony comes back home. In the fun little banter scene we get when Thor gets on the Guardian ship, he references as Guardians of the Galaxy. This is an actual 2018 Marvel comic series. When Peter returns to high school and gives Ned a big ol' hug, when he first comes into the school, if you look to the right of the frame, you'll notice a familiar face. It's an administrator who is actually being played by Ben Mendelsohn, aka Talos from the Captain Marvel film. Could that be ending the secret invasion? Towards the very end of the film, when Cap is returning to the past to return the Infinity Stones, he says to Bucky, don't do anything stupid until I get back. It's a line reference from the first Avenger. Bucky responds with the same line that Cap had said in the past saying, how can I? You're taking all the stupid with you. When we see old man Steve Rogers, he's wearing a tan jacket. It looks like the same jacket that he wore before becoming Captain America in the first Avenger. And then finally, the end credits. We didn't get an end credits scene, but we do hear a sound effect. It sounds like metal clanging. This is actually the sound effect from 2008's Iron Man when Tony was building the Mark I suit. And one final easter egg for you all. There was a line midway through the film that referenced an earthquake under the sea, to which Tony said that we handle it by not handling it. This could be a subtle hint to the existence of Namor the Submariner. Although considering the state of the rights surrounding the character, that seems uncertain. So let us know what you think in the comments below if you think it might actually be an easter egg. Alright friends, there we have it. All 80 for Easter eggs. Tell us if we missed any in those comments below. If you dug this video, hit that like button. Make sure you subscribe to Top 10 Nerd for as much MCU content as you can get your eyeballs on.